have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to turn your attention to the book of John, chapter 14. Amen. Praise God. Wednesday night, our youth service, Brother John Fortner did a wonderful job. Amen. God completely changed what John thought was going to happen, and God changes at the last moment. That's not an easy thing to do. Uh, but John was obedient, and uh, amen, God moved, and praise God, he read his text and then basically gave an altar call. That's probably not going to happen today, but if it does, so be it, but just want to let you know, amen, praise God. John Fortner just suddenly became First Pentecostal Church's favorite preacher, amen, <laughs> amen. John chapter 14, verse 6, one verse of scripture, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Let me give you my paraphrase. You ain't going to get there any other way. There's no other option. There's no other, uh, there's no other uh, uh, map. There's, there's no other path. He is the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me me. I want to for just a few moments this morning, I want to preach to you that it is never wrong to do what is right. It's never wrong to do what's right. Lord, we thank you this morning. God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for what you've already done. We rejoice, uh, God, in this young man receiving the Holy Ghost here today. Uh, and God, we thank you for that. Uh, and we ask, Lord, today, Lord, as you will continue, uh, anoint our hearts and our minds. Help us, uh, God, to hear and receive as you're going to speak to us. Help us to have understanding, uh, our comprehension to be increased. And we thank you for it this morning in Jesus' name. Uh, can we once again put our hands together and thank the Lord? He is wonderful. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. You can be seated for a moment this morning. Praise God. I think it is without any question that none of us here, and I'm going to speak for all of us, if, if I'm wrong, then so be it. But I think, amen, that none of us here would make the claim that God does not know what he is doing. And, and, and amen, nor does he not know the way that I or that we should go. Amen? I think all of us would agree that, that he, that God, is doing pretty well at being who he is. Amen? And yet there are times when we think that we know that which we do not actually know. Proverbs 16 tells us there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The Amplified says that there's a way that, that seems right to a man, appears straight before him, but at the end of it is the way of death. They think they're right, they think it's correct, but ends up that they were wrong. The effect of our fallen nature has caused you and I the inability to choose our own way. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. I am the life. It's not a way that you choose. It's not a way that I construct, but it's strictly based upon who Jesus says he is. Our adversary this morning, his tool of choice is by means of deception. Deception is the act of causing someone to accept as true or valid what is false or invalid. Amen. It involves deliberately hiding the truth to gain an advantage. The key element of deception is intent. It differs from an honest mistake in that the person creating the deception, he knows the information to be false while the receiver tends to believe it. 
In Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. The New King James says the serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts of the field. The word subtle is a behavior which deviates seriously from that which is morally correct. You could put the word perversion in there. It perverts what is true. It causes that which is true to appear to be false. It appeared, amen, as if he understood or he knew what he was talking about, meaning it looks like he he telling the truth but he's not it goes to show that we are so easily fooled you and I in humanity and that we in reality should never trust our own judgment on its own in Matthew chapter 7 Jesus said in verse 13 enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and notice Jesus said and many there be which go in there many will find that way because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life but the Bible says and few there be that Find it. Why will there be few that find the way that leads to life? It's not because it's a tremendous great mystery. It's not because, amen, it's disguised or under camouflage. Let me tell you, friend, the way is very clear. The way is in the open. It's not hiding behind anything. But the reason that people, amen, few will be finding that way is because God's way is not the easy way. And most people are looking for whatever is the easiest option. I'm not preaching that you earn salvation. That is not at all what I'm preaching. It is a gift from God. We are saved by grace through faith. But I'm going to tell you, if you're going to live for God, it's not going to be the easiest option available to you. Amen. All that follow after him got to do what? They got to deny themselves and they got to take up their cross. I'm telling you, it's going to be, a, it can be a difficult manner to live when it comes to our flesh today. Because God's way is not the easiest way. It would be easy to view Paul as a tremendous success, and that would not be false. He was. He had a tremendous ministry. He is the writer of the majority of the New Testament. His ministry was ultimately quite the success. But very few of us would be able to replicate what Paul did. Just from one passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 11, there are 23 things that he encountered. He was imprisoned. He was flogged more severely. He was exposed to death repeatedly. He received 39 lashes from the Jews five different times. He was beaten with rods three times. He was pelted with stones once, shipwrecked three times, spent a night and a day in the open sea. He was constantly on the move in danger from rivers, bandits, fellow Jews, Gentiles, in cities, in the country, at sea, from false brethren. He labored and toiled. He went without sleep. He knew hunger and thirst. He went without food, experienced cold and nakedness. He faced the daily pressure of concern for all the churches. I mean, that's a lot for one man to have to endure. And yet Paul says, for our light affliction, which is but for us a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Amen. I'm telling you, friend, if Paul's affliction was light affliction, you and I ain't got no affliction. But the reality is Paul had to endure some trials. Paul had to endure some hardships. It was not an easy road. But nowhere do you find where Paul wrote that he regretted doing what he did. But he was mad rather. He said, I rejoice in my infirmities. It's through my weakness that God's strength is made perfect. He's not the only one. Abraham, the father of Israel, amen, he's where it all started. It's where the Abrahamic covenant began. God made his covenant with Abraham, an everlasting covenant. And when he made that covenant with Abraham, he promised him a son. 
Abraham and Sarah, we know the story. He, they had to wait 25 years from the time God first promised them a son until Isaac was finally born. And after Isaac was born in Genesis 22, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Amen. That word tempt, it means to attempt to learn the true nature of something. He told Abraham, I want you to take your son and your only son Isaac whom you love and I want you to go to the land of Moriah and I want you to offer your son there as a burnt offering makes no sense that's what I'd be thinking God what are you talking about what do you mean take my son the one you promised me amen to offer him as a burnt offering I don't, I don't understand this Abraham, the Bible says he took the wood of the burnt offering. He laid it upon Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they were both of them together. And they went together. Isaac looked at Abraham, his father, and he said, Well, uh, uh, I, I see the fire. I see the wood. But, Dad, where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham looked at his son. He said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. I believe that Abraham knew that this was a promised child and that God was not going to waste his promise just upon an altar to never existing. I believe that Abraham believed that if Isaac was to be killed, God could resurrect it. One way or another, God was going to provide himself a lamb. Bible says that Abraham stretched forth his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven and said, Abraham, he said, here am I. Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything to him. For now I know I've tempted you. I have looked to learn and the true nature of your being, of your spirit. And so then, amen, God, the Bible says, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, and Abraham lift up his eyes and behold behind him a ram was caught in a thicket by his son that was the sacrifice that God was providing while they were walking up one side of the mountain that ram was getting in position God knew what he was going to do what he was asking of Abraham was not more than what Abraham could handle amen but from a human perspective it don't make sense Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're in a kingdom not because of their own doing. It's a, it's a result of the rebellion of their ancestors, and now they're in, cap, in Babylonian captivity. And, and the, the king has made this decree that every time you hear the sound of the certain music, you're supposed to bow to, to this image that has been made. And, and they've made up their mind. They ain't bowing to anything. They are not going to compromise their commitment to God. And so the, the, the penalty would be that if you don't bow, you're going to be thrown into this fiery furnace. And, and so he brings these three boys in front of him and they say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this man. We don't even really have to think about what we're going to say because if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. We know that God can do anything, but notice, amen, he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, amen, they didn't say, listen, King, you do what you want, but God's going to make sure we never see the inside of that furnace. You do whatever you want. You threaten us all you want because God's going to make sure we never face that furnace. That was not the case. They said, even if he doesn't, we know that we're not going to serve your gods. We know that we're not going to worship this golden image. Even when it was hard, it's still never wrong to do what's right. They knew what their options were. You kneel to the image and you live. But in doing so, you compromise your values and your obedience to God. But if you do not kneel, you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. That don't seem fair, does it? Amen. It don't make sense. Well, you go from one fiery furnace to another, a place called Zarephath which means a, 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 a smelter or a melting pot. The word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, Get thee to Zarephath. Amen. Behold, there I have commanded a woman 
to sustain thee. The name Zarephath, it stems from the Hebrew verb, which means to smelt, to refine, or test metals. Amen. In its noun form, Zarephath translates to a crucible or a smelting place. Amen. This etymology is closely tied to its t the town's identity. Amen. As Zarephath was known for manufacturing idols and jewelry through melting and refining techniques. Amen. It, it sounds a whole lot better to say, get thee to Zarephath, rather than say, Elijah, I'm sending you to a crucible. <laughs> I'm sending you to a furnace. He arose and he went to Zarephath and he noticed this woman gathering sticks and he said, I pr fetch me, I pray thee a, a little water in a vessel. And as she was going to get him a glass of water, he called and said, bring me, I pray thee, a, a morsel of bread as well. She looked at him and said, as the Lord God, thy God liveth, I don't have a cake, but all I've got is a little bit of meal in a barrel. I've got just a little bit of oil in a cruise. Uh, behold, here's what I'm doing. I'm gathering these two sticks. Uh, and I'm going to go in. I'm going to dress it uh, for me and my son uh, that we may eat it. Comma and die. This is our last meal. We don't got no more provisions. There's no more ingredients. There's no more, there's no more trucks of supply coming. This is all we've got. We're fixing to use it all. Elijah looks at her and says, Fear not. Go and do as you have said, but make me thereof a little cake first. Mm. For the Lord God of Israel has said, the barrel of meal will not waste. Neither shall the cruel cruise of oil fail. See, the story of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath, it presents a challenge, a, a, a test of faith and obedience. When Elijah asked the starving widow to use her last bit of flour and little bit of oil, to make him a cake before herself and her son. It was a very difficult request to make. And it was against all the cultural norms and required great trust in God's promise and provision. You see the widow of Zarephath, she was in tremendous dire circumstances. Amen. She was gathering these sticks again to prepare what she believed would be her final meal for herself and her, her son before they would succumb to the starvation due to the severe drought. With only a handful of flour and a little bit of oil remaining, the widow had no other prospects for survival. Her situation was so desperate that she expected to die after consuming their last meager portion of food. Can you imagine being in the shoes of Elijah, amen, and having to ask someone to give all that they have and give it all to you first? I don't know about you. I don't like imposing on nobody. It would be very difficult for me to say, hey, I want you to take the very last of what you possess. Give it to me. Matter of fact, I don't know. I, I, probably, I probably wouldn't have asked that question. The reason is, I, I, I couldn't understand the sense of it. I, well, who, who am I to take the very little that she has and take it for myself? But again, if he didn't ask the question, neither would she, her son, or even he would survive. The truth sometimes hurts. The truth is sometimes the hardest pathway to go on because, again, our flesh and our logic, uh, it goes against everything within us. Uh, the painful truth is always better than a comforting lie. Oh, you'll be fine. Just go ahead and you'll be fine. You, you, you go ahead. Hey, why don't you really in, eat that last cake? I mean, enjoy it, would you? You'll be okay. That was a lie. And the fact that he was requiring her to give him what she had, it was hard, but it's what opened the door from the miraculous. Can I tell you this morning, a lie does not care, amen, who, it, who tells it. But the truth is hard to tell because the truth is not normal. 
It, it don't carry the same weight or travel as far as what a lie does. But I'm going to tell you what the truth will do. The truth will set you free, but a lie will keep you in bondage. It may have been a hard thing to request, but in the end it saved both her family and Elijah because she did go and do according to the saying of Elijah. And the Bible says that she, he, and her house, they ate for many days. How was that possible? Because when she went in there, she took the last of the meal and she used the last of the oil. But the Bible says the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail somehow miraculously God always put more in the barrel God always put more in the cruise how did he do that that's not for you and I to understand you see all human reasoning screams to take care of yourself with what you have for as long as you can. But God's way says the first thing you do is you give all you have away and trust God to replenish your resource. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, For whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The message says, What kind of deal is it to give everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? Amen. Praise God. It says if you gain the whole world, but you lose. Everybody say lose. That means to fail to obtain a valued object. It means to lose something which you already possessed. The Bible says in Luke chapter 15, either that woman who having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does she not light a candle, sweep the house, and seek diligently until she find it? She understood the value of that one. If you don't value the one of all the, of the 10, it'll come a day when you won't have anything left. You've got to value what you possess. You've got to hold true to what you embrace. I'm telling you, oh, I'll never do that, Pastor. I'll never go down that road. Nobody ever backslides intentionally. There was a day when you would never, you would never miss the house of God. Every time the doors were open, you would be there. But if you're not careful, you'll find yourself sporadically making your way to the house of God. How could you ever become that? Why? Because you started not valuing that one piece. Instead of seeking the one thing you've lost, amen, you, 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 uh, uh, you, you kind of make up in your mind, you justify, well, I've got nine more. I don't need to seek for them. I'm telling you, you need to value this very thing that you have. Otherwise, you will lose it. Amen. What does that mean? To no longer know where something is. I don't want to lose it. I don't want to have had a hold of something and then all of a sudden not know where it's at. How, how do you keep that from happening? You hold it close to you. You get a hold on it. You get a grip on it that never, nothing will ever cause you to let it go. I don't want to go another day without finding that which I once had. How many here know today, amen, it is the will of God that every single one of us that we, we get to the end, that we make it to the end. It is the will of God, amen, that we would endure. It is the will of God, amen, that, that we didn't just start out in this race, but that we would finish this race, that we would run this race, amen, with a mindset to obtain, amen, to win, to finish. But I'm telling you, if you don't hold dear to the very thing that this represents, you'll find yourself sitting on the sidelines. It's never wrong to do what's right. Oftentimes, we're not comfortable with God's ways. They, they seem beyond possible. Now, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be completely honest with you. If I was that widow woman in Zarephath, knowing that that's all I had, knowing that I had a son 
that was hungry. And I'm in there cooking with the last bit of ingredients that I had. And I'm going through all this toiling of preparing this cake. And the thought of that me or my son's not going to be able to benefit from this. But I'm going to give it to the stranger, really. I didn't even know who he was. That would be hard for me to do. Preparing that cake. Holding it. Walking out from the kitchen knowing that there's nothing left there. From my perspective, I'll never make another cake there. And taking and handing it to Elijah. I don't know, maybe, obviously it did. It crossed her mind to think, well, maybe the God of Elijah, that he could actually do what he says he could do. Because at some point she walked back in her kitchen and she, she grabbed that cup and she reached into that barrel. And it would, if it were me, it would be to my surprise. Oh my goodness, there's enough for one more cake. She reached for that cruise of oil that was empty and she dipped it or she began to tip it over and realize, oh my goodness, there's enough oil for one more cake. This happened, the Bible says, for many days. On the other side, this, this was the greatest thing to, she could ever do. It makes perfect sense now that she did what she did. But there was a small moment of time where she left an empty kitchen and gave what she had to the man of God not knowing if there'd be anything left. But I'm going to tell you, amen, we are not always comfortable with God's ways. They seem to go beyond possible. It's, it just, it's, not, it's just not how things are supposed to be. Humanly speaking, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I'm here to tell you this morning, God's never going to leave you. He'll never forsake you. But He'll let you make your choices. If you want to so choose to reason and, and, and have your logic to say, well, I just don't see that that... I just think that's a little too extreme, Pastor. You have every right to think that way. You have every right to choose however you want to choose. But I'm going to tell you, you're going to always be better off to do it the way God says to do it. It's never wrong to do what's right. Amen. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. I'm, we're getting ready to land. It came to pass after this, the children of Moab, the children of Ammon, them which were behind, besides the Ammonites, they came against Judah. Jehoshaphat was the king. And there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee. Amen. Jehoshaphat, he feared, and he set himself to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. And Judah gathered together, themselves together, to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. In response to their prayers, God speaks through a prophet Jehaziel, amen, promising divine intervention, instructing that the people to stand firm and to witness the salvation from the Lord. God assured the people that they would not need to even fight in this battle. Instead, he directed them to position themselves to stand firm and again, witness his salvation. Verse 17, it says, You shall not need to fight in this battle yourselves. Stand ye still. See the salvation of the Lord with you. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. The opposing army was extremely intimidating. Judah was greatly outnumbered. There is no specific numbers given, but the repeated use of terms such as great multitude, vast army, indicates that it was a significantly large force. 
The Bible says in verse 20, they rose up early in the morning. They went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Now, I'm not a man of war. I've never been in the military. But this is not a tactical approach that the army today does. Because when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord and that, and that they, they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. You gotta get the picture. They're going to go into the battlefield but instead of there being men of war with weapons, the front line consisted of the choir. And they went doing what choirs do. They, they were singing and they were praising God. <laughs> Don't make no sense. How are we gonna win this kind of battle? Come on, King, are you, are you sure about this? I don't think they're going to... I'm going to tell you, I, I can scare some people pretty bad with my singing. But I don't think I can even sing that bad to cause them to run. It don't make sense. But the Bible says that's what they did. Verse 22, And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord said, this is my battle. The Bible says the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon. And the Bible says they were smitten. They were destroyed. Can I tell you what an ambushment is? It means to conceal oneself or to proceed secretly while waiting for an appropriate opportunity to attack. Meaning that while they're stepping onto the battlefield and while they're lifting their voice in song and praise, it would appear for a moment of time, nothing's good's gonna happen here. They're gonna destroy us. But God was waiting for the appropriate opportunity to come out of concealment and step onto the scene and take care of the battle. That's why, church, it may not look appealing. It may not look sensible all the time, but that's the reason I'm going to lift my hands. I'm going to lift my voice. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice because I know the battle I'm facing. It's not my battle. I've got a God who will fight for me. Amen. Don't make a lot of sense. That's why, church, we want to be a church that is full of worship. We want to be a church, uh, amen, that, that is quick to praise God. You say, well, what do you mean? You, you, you kind of get us up here and cheerlead us. No, 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 no. I'm telling you, the more you get an understanding uh, that there's something powerful uh, about our declaration of worship, uh, about our declaration of praise, uh, I'm telling you, amen, it's not, it's not by bombs and guns the battle is won, uh, but it's through our worship and our praise. Uh, it's by doing things uh, that the people on the outside will say, oh, those are crazy people. And look how they act. Let me tell you, friend, the reason we do this is because we know that there is a God who's in the midst of us and at the appropriate time He'll take care of it. Amen. I don't ever want to waste an opportunity to worship Him. I don't, we talked about the spirit of heaviness this morning. Oh, it's a, it is, it's powerful. Yes, it is. And it, and it can be very difficult to overcome. But I'm going to tell you, you will never overcome that spirit, amen, by disassociating yourself from his praise. You become a praiser. You become a worshiper. And you'll find yourself getting closer to him and further away from that spirit of heaviness. It's never wrong to do what's right as we stand here today.
Praise God. There are countless other examples we could share this morning as to that which the people of God did didn't make any sense. It defied all logic. It went against everyone's reasoning. But I'm not here to try to make sense of it. I'm just here to tell you it works. I'm here to tell you and declare that He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. There is no other way to God but through Him. I'm not looking for another way. I'm not looking for something that's more modern. I'm not looking for something that's more seeker friendly. I'm not looking for something that's more more uh, uh, prevalent for the for the moment we're living in. I'm telling you, what we've got is real. What we've got, uh, Amen, does not need improving. Uh, what we got uh, does not need remodeled. Uh, amen. What we've got uh, in its original form is just as powerful today as it's ever been. Amen. But what about you and I? Would you be willing to make your last cake and be obedient to the word of God and let go of the very thing that you felt was your most prized possession? Would you be willing to go into battle not armed with a gun, but rather a, a, man, a guitar or a, a drum or just your voice of praise? Would that? None of that makes a lot of sense. But I'm gonna tell you, friend, God knows exactly what he's doing. Amen. It doesn't make sense that for me to live, I've got to die. It doesn't make sense for me to be lifted. I've got to be humbled. It doesn't make sense in our, in our human mind and reasoning that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. But I'm going to tell you, every single time I have put those things in practice, I have reaped the benefits of it. It's true. It works. Amen. It's, it, it is exactly what I need. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to rejoice in God. I'm going to go ahead when everything else around me is falling apart. You're not going to, you're not, I'm not going to lower my praise. I'm not going to tone it down a little bit to, to match my circumstance, to match the atmosphere. No, no, no. I'm going to keep on worshiping. I'm going to keep on magnifying find God. I'm going to keep on declaring his goodness because I know a God who's not finished. If it's not good, he's not done because God is going to work all things together for good. Amen. Anybody feel a little insane here today? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over expecting different results. That is the definition of insanity. Spiritually, it's okay to be a little bit insane because I'm going to keep worshiping. I'm going to keep praising God. I'm going to stay faithful to His Word. I'm, going to, I'm, not, I'm not going to quit doing what's right. I'm going to be not weary in well-doing for in due season I'm going to reap. I'm telling you, God is going to confirm His Word with signs following. God is going to do what He has promised He's going to do. He is faithful to perform what He has promised. I'm going to keep doing, amen, those things. And I'm going to continue to expect God to do what He has claimed and promised to do. This morning as we begin to sing, amen. Anybody here got, you got that, that angel, that devil on your shoulders? The devil over here on your shoulders telling you, man, that preacher's lost his mind. You're smarter than that. You've got more logic than that. What he is saying will make you look like a fool. But on the other shoulder, you've got uh, that word, that, that angel that's saying, hey, what he has preached to you is the word of God. What he has preached to you is the very thing that God says he'll take care of. What are you going to choose to do this morning? How are you going to respond to your troubles? How are you going to respond, amen, to the life uh, that you're facing here today? Come on, church. Amen. It's never wrong to do what's right. No matter how crazy it may sound, it's never wrong to do what's right. Come on. In the name of Jesus. Oh, we declare it today. We believe it this morning. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Come on, let's find us a place. Hallelujah. Let's lift our voices unto the Lord here today. In Jesus' name. full attention when you speak you will be heard show me deeper revelation
salvation as I seek you through your word. May I never lose this passion. Let it burn within my heart and let every vain distraction be consumed by all. 